Jared Roser here today with Danny Broussard, legendary Hall of Fame basketball coach at St. Thomas More in Lafayette. Uh, and I mean, we say basketball coach because because that's what I think as many people around the state know you for. But you've you've coached several sports, many tennis state championships, along with the basketball state championships, and been doing it for quite a while. Um, appreciate you taking a couple minutes to join me, man. I know it's it's been kind of a crazy spring. It's it's good to see you. Yeah, no problem, man. Well, you know, you and I go back a long way. A long, well, I say a long way, you know, relatively, because you're so damn young. But we go back a little ways, you know. So our top 28 days when we met. So, uh, yeah, uh, no, always a pleasure to meet with you, Jared. And, uh, yeah, I tell you, man, it's uh, it's been something else. You know, you think about the last event at STM was March the 13th, and <laughs> that was the state championship game, which never before – I say never before. I don't know, somebody said back in the 60s they held it. You know, it, before the top 28 was invented, they held it at home gyms, you know, but it's been 60 years. So, anyway, you know, the first time we ever get to host a home game, uh, we're all pumped up, 1,500 sold out. It's going to be a crazy night at, at the Cougar Dome. And uh, next thing you know, before we know it, we're going down to 250, watching it, and then all of a sudden, no, there's nobody. You can't have anybody in the stands. And, uh, Jared, when I'm telling you, that was – I can't, to this day, I can't explain it, you know. It was very surreal to be in a gym. Like I told somebody, I said, it was kind of like a scrimmage. I said, well, kind of, but even at a scrimmage, you, we got parents there, you know, watching, you know. And I'm telling you, there was nobody there. It was, I mean, it was, it was definitely something that I'll never, ever, ever forget. And, you know, I'm sure all the players in those games will, you know, never forget it. It's a story they're going to tell their, their kids and grandkids for years that, you know, but uh, as you and I were talking before we, we got on the air, man, thank God we got to play that game, Jared, you know, because I couldn't imagine – uh, being in a point where either, you know, in the final four and then this thing stops and hey, you can't play anymore. Even, you know, that day say, hey, look, I'm sorry, but we've got to stop everything, you know, knowing that you'd be in a state championship game, but you couldn't play it. Man, I can't even imagine that. So uh, thank God we got a chance to play that game and finish it off. Yeah, you guys end up uh, beating U High 57-56 to win yeah. the third straight state championship. And with the way everything's gone in retrospect, it might have it might have been easier to – to realize how significant of a, a point in, in our society we were yeah. getting to with all this. But I mean, trying to navigate and manage this situation that early when really things were starting to happen and we had no idea or concept of how crazy it was going to be. Wow. I, I can only imagine trying to have those conversations with uh, I mean, not only the, the parents and fans, but I mean, you're talking about, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old guys who are on the cusp of, of adding to that STM legacy. It, yeah. it just seems like such a bizarre week for y'all. It, 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 Jared, it really was, man. It really was. We played St. Louis on the Tuesday night, beat them in advance. And, you know, Jared, another thing that people didn't realize is that not only was I, not only was it just a regular home game, but we were hosting a state championship event, you know, and, you know, Jared, I've been, I've been going to, uh, when, when it was back in the right Peach parish Coliseum, uh, I think my earliest, I was probably five years old. My brother, Ricky, was a coach, you know. He took me to the top 28. Uh, my brother, my brother Brent Broussard, played in the top 28 uh, in 1969, you know. I mean, I've been going to that event since I've been a kid, man, and, so, and never missing. And so I knew what that experience was like. I, you know, I've been coaching for a while now. Been to, you know, I think 15 top 28s. So, Jared, I really, as best as I could, we wanted to try to make that, a top 28 experience, even though it was going to be at STM, you know? So when St. Louis came in, you can, you can ask coach Lobato, you know, we, we don't ever, we don't ever do this. Actually. We turned the lights out. We got spotlights. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, again, we tried to make it special for those kids. We fed them at the uh, Pete's, a Lafayette restaurant. Pete's uh, fed the team because I remember back when the blue coats had it at top 28, you know, they would feed the team. So I said, let's, let's try to make it as special as we can. So, so we, you know, we were doing all that stuff. So all this planning, not just playing the game, all this planning, okay? So then we win that game on Tuesday. Well, guess what? Now, we had met a week prior, you know, hoping it was going to be the state championship game, what we were going to do. So we had this, what we call a fan day experience, all planned. And, again, we learned from our football team, who they also hosted for the first time the state championship. So we had, we had experience from them, so we learned from them. Uh, you know, Kim's our AD, so he went through all that. So we had a meeting a week, two weeks before all this went down, saying, in the event we win the state championship game, what are we going to do? So for Friday, we were dismissing school at noon and going to have a, a long uh, outside a fanfare day. Uh, we were having ball crawfish for all fans. And, and Jared, not only for the STM fans, but we, we invited the U High fans. They were invited to come to this fan day as well. You know, we want to make it special for everybody. 
So that was a lot of planning that went into all this, you know, and to think the day of, we have to cancel everything. I mean, it was, I mean, that, I, was pretty, I was pretty fast on the Friday, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I, you know, if I'm going everything, they're trying to get uh, only 250 fans in at one time, you know, having to re rededicate the tickets to you high parents and our parents. And then an hour later, when Mr. Bonine said, hey, y'all, nobody in the gym. So then we said, y'all, no, y'all, none of y'all can come. It was, it was, it was a crazy experience, a crazy day. Uh, you know, to think that I had to, you know, play a game that night and try to coach through that. Uh, I wouldn't want to ever, I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody because it, it really, it was a, it was a tough day, you know, but we made it through and obviously winning a state championship kind of, kind of made it, made it pretty nice. You know, if we'd have lost that game, I think I'd have been devastated for all the time and effort we put into it, but there's nothing we can do. And like I said, it unraveled so fast. And, and Jared, I really had a bad feeling. Uh, I'm not sure if it was what day it was Rudy Gobert got, you know, the NBA. Uh -huh. When I saw that happening, man, I had a bad feeling. And uh, my assistant coach was on Wednesday. So the game was on Friday. I seriously, I asked him on Wednesday, I said, hey, guys, you think we could pull this off? This was like Wednesday about noon. I said, I got a bad feeling. You think we could play this game on Thursday? And they were like, man, coach, you know, why, why are you thinking that? I said, because I'm, I'm getting worried that this game won't even happen. I said, man, I said, the sooner the better. So I said, and they were like, oh, I don't think it's going to happen that fast, you know. And so we just said, okay, we're going to let it go, you know. But I really had seriously thoughts of playing that game on Thursday. And now that would have been wild because we'd have had a, you know, a packed house, you know. But again, the way it unraveled, we got a chance to play the game on Friday. And it is what it is. But it was something that I, I will never, as a coach, ever, ever forget, you know. And hoping, hoping that never happens happen again, you know. Yeah, you guys had played on Tuesday, and then the the Rudy Gobert and the NBA shutdown happened that that next day, that Wednesday yeah. night. Our our guy Andrew Lopez was in Sacramento waiting for a game to start that just never happened because they got word of what was happening in Utah, and and everything continued to wow. unfold so quickly over okay. those next couple of days. Yeah. And, and you've been coaching a long time; you've seen a lot. I mean, you you took the reins of of that Cougars program at at 23 in the early 80s. Yeah. I'm sure nothing else has ever been during basketball season quite quite like this. No, not 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 anything. And like I said, the idea that we had to host, you know, just added to everything. And then you know, we're, we're trying to make everything. And then did this happen? So man, it was yeah, it was it was a tough it was a tough day. And then like I said, uh, we did manage it the best I could. As a matter of fact, my AD came at around at a, when all this was going down. It's about you know three o'clock, and I I usually kind of go home a little bit, kind of. I just kind of have this thing. I, I just go in for about an hour and a half and a half and just kind of try to get myself focused for the games. It's just what I do, you know. And uh, Kim knows that. He said, hey, look, dude, you know, there's nothing more you can do. You can't just, you know, go home. Because you can tell I was, you know, I was really kind of not focused at all. And uh, he said, go home. So I came home and tried to gather myself and, you know, said, look, it's beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. Let's just focus on the game, you know. So, um uh, Anyway, yeah, it was it was it was crazy how all this how so fast how all this went down so fast and uh, again like I said to think that you know we, we went in the gym on Saturday because our uh, we we did a, a graduation where we, we brought in twenty graduates at a time and we walked them to the stage you know and we, we videoed everything mm -hmm. and then on Tuesday night they put the video together and kind of had an actual graduation ceremony uh, and that was the first time anybody had ever been back in the gym since the state championship game and we lined up twenty graduates all the way around the gym keeping them ten foot apart and so. Uh, yeah, nothing has taken place in there since then. And uh, uh, it's just kind of a, a weird feeling, you know, to have that gym just so unoccupied for, for two months. Yeah, it's never been that way, you know. Yeah, and you, I mean, mentioning you starting out at, at such a, an early age in that role and now this year you get to the 1,000 wins. You, a few years ago, were inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, looking at, even though it was such a weird end to this season, uh, such a memorable season for you guys to, to get to that thousand win mark for you and to, to close it out with another state championship. I mean, if, if you tell 23 year old Danny that, that this is where this thing gets and, and you're running off the repeats and yeah. now a handful of state championships and, and reaching a thousand, how, how crazy is it to think of, of the big picture of, of where you are now and where this program is now? Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, you never could imagine anything like that. It is kind of funny, though, Jared, in 86, you know, when I was 26 years old, we won our first one in 86, you know. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'd been coaching, you know, what, 23, so like three, three years, my third, third, fourth year. And I'm thinking, well, you know, this wasn't too bad. I, you know, hey, I, I, you know, I might could win maybe 10 of them, you know. I'm thinking, just, it's kind of easy, you know. And so little did I know that from, 80, from 86 to 2013 would be my next state championship. You know, I had to wait that long. And so I realized, God, man, you know, 
it just, it just, I think don't, I think people don't realize Jared that it just takes so many factors, you know, like, like Jared, some of my really good teams, like I've had some really good teams that I think were state championship caliber teams, you know, but in that year, you know, that, you know, you, you saw, you know, Peabody had one of their best teams ever. We got beat by them uh, one year. We, we lose three years in a row in the state quarterfinals. I thought we could have been state championship team. We lose to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, oh, go hold on. Win, win, is it Winsboro? Winsboro, I think. Um, Winfield, Winfield or Winsboro? No, it was Winsboro. And they went on to the state championship game. We lost to, uh, to Carr. That's when they had Patrick Sertan was playing for them. He was a tremendous athlete. Played, what, 20 years or 15 years in the NFL? Anyway, Sertan, they beat us at the buzzer. We lost on the road at Winsboro. And then the next year, it was uh, Carr, Winsboro, and um, um, I can't remember who the third team was, but somebody uh, really, really good, you know. So three years in a row, I felt like, man, we could have been state champion teams, and we get beat by some really, really outstanding teams, you know. And then other years, you know, I know, I know one year, um, now we got beat by Washington Marion bad in the semifinals, but that's a year that we probably should have never even made it to the top 28. But our kids played unbelievable. We really played above our heads. We went to St. Martinville and beat a good St. Martinville team on the road to qualify for the top 28. So, you know, it's just been some ups and downs, but, uh, you know, yeah, to win three in a row, I do have, I do have a special set of athletes coming through right now that, you know, has made this run possible, you know, and, uh, you know, Jared, I don't, I don't ever underestimate or not talk about my assistant coaches because I get all the credit, you know, but look, I'm going to tell you, man, I've been blessed with some great assistant coaches. You know, it all started with Kim Broussard, who's now my athletic director. You know, I stole Kim from VC. He was the head coach of the class, with a school, you know, and he was like, so I got him from as, as the head coach to come be an assistant. And that's, that's how good a program St. Thomas Moore is. You know, we can attract, you know, guys like that, you know, and, and to be honest with you, Kim is the only assistant uh, that I've ever had that hasn't been an STM alone. That's because he's too old to be an STM alone, right? He was already at VC. He graduated from Maurice High School. A uh, little, little tidbit about Kim Broussard. Uh, he still holds the record. So, so Jared, when I was going through all this stuff, one thing I want to tell you about was, to make, you know, I want, again, I'm all about, I'm a tradition, I'm a history guy. And so I called the LHSA, had a little problems getting all this, but I finally got it. But I asked him, I said, hey, I want the records of the top 28. Because tomorrow night at our, I mean, well, this was a week before. I said, we may break a record. And I want to know what the records are, because we might break a top 28 record, right? Because I know, you know, you as a sports guy, you were sitting at that table. And that's something y'all look at. You know, he said, hey, this guy scored 40 points. Let's see, is it a, is it a top 28 record? So I wanted all that ahead of time because again, I want if a kid broke a record, it's part of I wanted it to be to be in that record book. So when they send the record books, I always check and see. And Kim Broussard to this day still holds the class C record for most assists in the game. He was a hell of a passer. He couldn't shoot worth a lick, but he could pass the ball. <laughs> he could pass it. So uh, you know, so anyway, so Kim was my assistant the first year. You know, when I, after that, you know, I, and I hate to start naming because I got eight of them and I, I don't leave any of them out, you know but they've all been STM alums, you know, and I've been blessed with a great coaching staff that, you know, it just makes my job a lot easier. You know, when you get in the playoffs and you got to start scouting, you know, you need help with that. And I've got some guys that really uh, prepare our team as far as, you know, what the other team does, we break it down a lot and uh, they're really good at that, you know? And uh, uh, so I've been blessed with some great assistant coaches. I don't want to take credit for all this because I could do it without them. And again, you know, we've had some, we've had some good players come through our program, you know? So, uh, I've been a lucky guy. I've been in the right place at the right time. Um, somebody posed this question to me about three years ago after, and, and, and we won the first of the three state championships. And they said, hey, hey Danny, had Ricky say, you know, I, I, some people don't know, Ricky, my Bruce was my brother, and he was the first, first year of the school, he was the head coach. And I was just a freshman coach, you know. And, uh, and then a funny thing happened, transpired. We, we lose our assistant coach, Steve Reese. He wanted to become a doctor. And so, and he was like, you know, I don't know what, Steve was like 30 years old, you know, and he was always a practical joker. And he said, he told my brother, Rick, he said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of coaching. I'm going to be a doctor. And when he said to my brother, I thought he was joking. He goes, yeah, right, Steve. Because again, I guess he was 30 years old. He said, yeah, right, Steve. No, I'm serious. So when Steve Reese left, I, I kind of like just bumped up, right? Because I'm the third guy in line. I'm, you know, I'm, um, there's Ricky, Steve Reese, and me. So Reese leaves, so I get kind of bumped up to the JV guy, you know, and we have another guy to be the freshman coach. And, uh, and then, then, then Ricky, the, the next year, starts the season. And then Bobby Pasco calls her and says, hey, I need an assistant coach, you know. And he, and he says, when? He said, like, next week. <laughs> so I'm like, Ricky brings me in and he goes, hey, uh, I just got off of the UL job. And that's the first thing I asked him, I said, oh, really, you start next year? He goes, no, next week. I was like, what? So I said, who's, who's going to coach STM? <laughs> he looked, I'll never forget this. He looks around the room. 
<laughs> There's nobody there but me and you. He goes, you are. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm 23 years old. I'm not, I'm not ready for it, Jed. I really wasn't, you know. And he said, hey, look, you've been coaching. You, know, you coached Babe Ruth baseball when you were 18 years old. Uh, he kind of threw a joke in. He said, you coached the 4-H team at Mo when you were 15. And it's, it's a true story. I did. I was, a, I, was a, well, I was 17. I was a senior at Mo, and I was the 4-H club president. And back then, they had a basketball tournament for 4-H men. And it was a big thing. It really was. And so, man, I took these little 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th graders. We practiced for about three or four times. And I took them to the tournament in Kaplan. We won the whole thing. Man, I was proud as could be bringing that trophy into the, to the gymnasium for a, for a little pep rally we had on the, on the money. Bring the 4-H state champ, I mean, the uh, 4-H, whatever it was, championship trophy. And, you know, so he made a joke about it. And he said, you've been coaching all, you know, a long time. He said, so, you know, you're ready for this. You can do it. You know, you're trying to give me some confidence and I mean, seriously, I wasn't ready for that job. We had a, we had a great team. I took them. We, went, we won district, lost the first playoff game, figuring it's, it, it's done. I, mean, I had a good run, but they're going to hire somebody, you know, with experience. It's St. Thomas Moore, you know, certainly going to hire you know, somebody with experience. And I tell you, the guy, Jake, uh, Jake Bottle was the athletic director, and he really went to bat for me, you know. I, the, my first year that I did every, anything he wanted me to do. I coached freshman football, freshman basketball, and I coached baseball. Now, now Jared, I'm not sure you even know this, but – in 80, in my first year of the school in 82, 83, Doug Taylor was our baseball coach. Doug's daddy is Pete Taylor. He coached at Southern Miss for years. Matter of fact, they named the baseball field. It's called the Pete. And then after that, and I, I was fortunate to get the coach on the Doug Taylor. He was an awesome guy. I learned a lot about, you know, again, baseball and basketball is different. But, you know, I learned a lot, Jared, about just coaching, about how to handle kids from Doug Taylor. He was, he was a tremendous coach. And, and, and just knowledgeable in the game. But anyway, so I got a coach. I got to be his assistant coach for, for one year. And, or for, well, for, no, for about four or five years. But, but we went in the state championship the first year of school, and that was our first state championship. So my first ring ever was at, was at STM was for baseball, and I love baseball. You know, it was my, one of my favorite sports growing up as a kid. I, I was the center fielder, played Babe Ruth baseball all the way through. And like I said, I coached in 80, 1980. Uh, we won the state championship. Uh, so, so, you know, again, I'd been coaching kind of, you know, since I've been young. So anyway, anyway, I take that team and Bala went to bat for me. I, I, uh, two weeks later, my principal brings me in. He asked me like three times, do you want to be the head coach? And I just said, hey, I think it'd be a great time for me to interview. Because when you interviewed me the first time, it really was for the math job. You know, I was just a freshman coach, you know. So I said, I think it'd be good to be interviewed as for a head coaching job. And, you know, I said, I'll put my name in the hat. So he asked me again, he said, coach, do you want to be the head coach? So I said, yes, sir. So finally, after that meeting, at the time I was uh, – I called, called my wife. I said, man, I had the strangest meeting. He asked me like three times if I wanted to be the head coach. She said, well, he just wanted to make sure you wanted to interview. A week later, through no interviews, Jared, he didn't interview anybody at all. In my, con in my box was my contract. And I was like, damn, he gave it to me, you know. So, you know, I, I think that kind of really spurred me on, you know. I know everybody's watching, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, you know what, sp what spurs him on. And, 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 and for me, the motivation was that I had to prove myself that because I am so young. Jake Bottle took a chance on me. I wanted to prove him right, you know. And so and I worked my tail off. I'm not going to lie, Jared. I, I, my, I got a great work ethic because my mom and dad were, were hard workers. You know, we were – my dad, Jared, had two big jobs. He was a superintendent. He worked his construction work outside for 40 years with the same company. My mom was a housewife, but she worked her tail off. And when my dad got back home from, at 5 o'clock from work, he, had, he, he did a rice farm. He was a rice farmer. He had two full-time jobs. So I learned work ethic from him, you know. And so – uh, I really, uh, it's one thing about me. I say it all the time when I'm in that, in that coffin, they're going to look down there and they'll probably have a lot of things to say about it. I don't think anybody's ever going to come in and say that was one lazy son of a gun. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, you know, I worked for that job. I worked hard and I, you know, I tried to do the best thing I could. And, you know, one thing led to another and we kind of, you know, won some games. And then, like I said, I get a job in three years later, winning a state championship. And I think, you know, doing that, Jared, I think around the Lafayette community, it kind of brought some awareness that, Man, St. Thomas Moore. Because, you know, we're a brand new school, Jared. Nobody knows who we are. And, uh, and so, uh, by the way, I want to come back. I want to tell you the, the, our biggest win in STN history. Uh, it's the it was the first, first year. But anyway, so I think that really, you know, uh, in the community, you know, we got, we're able to get maybe good little players that said, maybe they didn't have the interest in coming to STM, started thinking about, well, golly, that's a pretty good basketball school there. They want a state championship. You know, I might want to go to school there. And I think that, you know, uh, allowed us to get some pretty – pretty good players. Cause again, look, you can't, you don't win no thousand games without, with, with some, with some lemons, you know, you know, so you got, I got some horses, you know, so I've been blessed, but yeah, I want to tell you this story. Um, Cause I know, you know, Gary Dewey that coached at Redemptors back in the day. Sure. Um, 
we're playing. Okay, so I'm the, again, I'm, remember, I'm the freshman coach. We go into the American Press Tournament. It's the first year of St. Thomas More, okay? So think about this. We consolidate Fatima Cathedral. Nobody, nobody knows who St. Thomas More is, right? We drive up to Lake Charles. Guess who we play the first game? Well, they, it's like any tournament, right? You put a good team against somebody who's no good. So we get to face Redemptorist. They had just come off a tournament in Memphis, Tennessee. It's one of these national tournaments. They come back. They win the whole thing. I think at the time, they were in the top 10 in the country. They were ranked like number eight. You know, USA Today used to rank them back then. And they were like number eight, just win this big tournament. So, uh, you know, we probably got them at the right time. So, because they come back from Memphis. I'm sure they got back on a Sunday. Probably didn't practice on Monday. We get them back on a Wednesday, right? So, it's St. Thomas More against Redemptors. It's Ricky Broussard against Gary Dewey. Now, you're not going to find two better coaches than that, right? So, my brother Ricky was, you know, our team prepared. We practiced hard. We, we, Jerry, we go in there, and I'm telling you, uh, I mean, my, this is what my brother Ricky said. You know, you can about imagine. We'd be the, the eighth-ranked team in the country. We're a brand-new school. When we got there, I can remember people asking, hey, where, where are y'all from? Well, we're from Lafayette, Louisiana, brand-new school. Oh, okay. I like your uniforms. They're nice. We'll get brand new. Ricky spent ten thousand dollars on uniforms in nineteen. Can you imagine nineteen eighty three? Yeah. Ten thousand dollars. That'd probably be like about twenty five today. Ricky. That's one thing about Ricky. He didn't cut too many corners. I kind of. I'm kind of frugal when it comes to. Ricky got nothing but the best. Anyway, so so look in the dressing room, Jared. I'll never forget his speech. Everybody was so pumped up. We were high five, and we're. And I never forget. He sat down. And he said, "Hey, men." We just put St. Thomas More basketball on the map tonight. This was the night. This is a historic night in STM history. You put STM basketball on the map, and it's true. Think about it. We be redemptors who, what, at that time, they had 15 state championships, whatever they have, you know. And that, that really set us as that, you know, hey, look, you know, we're not just some little school here, that new school that's not going to compete. We're going to compete our first year. And I think we set the tone, you know, for many years. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, you mentioned – you mentioned Redemptorist, and yeah. one of the, the stories on the Louisiana high school level this week is that Sid Edwards and another, you know, very successful coach at Redemptorist and, and yeah. his other stops along the way, he's going to be coaching some basketball this year for Central on top of his football oh. duties. And, and he's, I mean, he's coached several sports throughout his time as well. Yeah. When you, when you look at your approach as, as somebody that's coached several different sports, I, I think, Sometimes outside of the sports world, people don't realize some of those those carryover aspects of just working with teams and, and being a leader, regardless of what the sport happens to be at that time. How do you view some of those aspects in terms of your approach to, obviously there's a lot of X's and O's that come with basketball and different basketball specific things, but the aspects that enable you to be a successful coach in a variety of, of different sports just knowing that, that you're leading some, some young folks. Yeah. Jared, obviously one of the most rewarding, you know, rewarding parts of our job is, you know, getting to work with, with, with young athletes, you know I mean? You know, they're so impressionable at that age, you know, you, you know, it's really more than basketball or coaching baseball or tennis, whatever, you know, the coach, the force that I coach, I, believe it or not too, I actually coach softball as well too. I love coaching softball. That was fun. Uh, but, but anyway, um, you know, it's just to be around kids. You know, somebody said, well, you know, God, how you got so much energy? I said, man, I, I get it from our kids that I coach. You know, I mean, you know, you go in every day. The, the, that's the great thing about coaching. Every year, you know, you, you I mean, I, I lost five really good seniors. You know, God, it's hard, hard to see them go. You know, and at the same time, you say, you anticipate, okay, next year is going to be different. You got new players coming in. You still got a few returning. But it's just so challenging every year, Jared. To, and you, like you talked about, to build a team, you know. I've always been kind of team oriented. I think I learned that, you know, I played for Ricky when I was at Mo High School. I played for a guy named Frank Hardy. I had a Hall of Fame principal named Raymond Rupert that, that I was under, you know, and so I've been fortunate to, to, to be around some great coaches, you know, and bar none of them. I think the guys that I've always been around have always coached team first, you know, you, you got to have a team. Yeah, you know, hey, one player can take it on away, but if you're going to win state champs, if you're going to be competitive year in and year out, you got to form a team, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've been kind of successful a lot. And, Jared, I think one of the things I'm proud of, yeah, you know, look, five state championships is awesome. It really is. But, you know, it's really not about that. It's about, you know, when I look out right now, 
and I, I got it. We have, I have a database of my alumni. I know I got about a hundred, uh, about almost 200 now former basketball players, you know, that I've coached and, uh, we, you know, we kind of keep up with each other, you know, and, 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 you know, we, when something happens, we're always there, you know, uh, to pick one another up and stuff. And, uh, but man, when I look at and how successful that my former players, you know, what they're doing now, you know, raising families, raising kids, uh, having a successful business, struggling right now. You know, I got a guy in oil and gas, one of my best friends is in oil and gas and they're struggling right now. You know, he's just trying to keep his head above water, you know, but just to see them and to see what they've done. I mean, that's the most rewarding part of, of our, of our job, but bar none, you know, it's just awesome to, 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 to see that, you know, and that to me, you know, it kind of, kind of puts it in perspective what it's all about, you know? And uh, the other thing I want to say too, is I know you saw that video we had this year of our, uh, of our options game, you know, where we have special needs kids, you know, and it's really kind of put up, it's kind of, like I always had a place in my heart for those kind of guys. Uh, as you well aware, me and Alfonsi Ellis, you know, he was, he was one of my best friends in, in life, you know, and Alfonsi, if people don't know, uh, Alfonsi, he was famous and he was, he was, as they called it back in those days, Dale Brown had him on the show and Dale Brown introduced him and said, this is Alfonsi Ellis. He's mentally retarded. And when Alfonsi went back to Jonesville, Louisiana, the lawyer approached him on the street because he'd walk all the way. And he said, Alfonsi, come here. And he said, uh, hey, I just saw you on the Dale Brown show. Boy, Alfonsi, his, his chest came out and he said, yeah, you saw me, huh? And he said, yeah. He said, hey, guess what? He said, we're going to sue Dale Brown. And Alfonsi had a puzzled look on his face. And he says, what do you mean? He said, well, he called you mentally retarded on TV. We're going to sue him. And in Alfonso's way, you'd have to know it, but he put his hands on his hips and he goes, like hell you are. Went home. He went home and told his sister what happened. And they went there and they said, if you say anything again, we're going to sue you. And, uh, and that's the story of Alfonso Ellis, you know, and I used to bring him in uh, for years at, at for the Sunkiss shootout. We put him in the hotel and he'd come around and I mean, he's a celebrity, you know, uh, and um uh, and so I've always had a special place in my heart for, for, for those kind uh, the special needs kids. And this year we did that and we had the greatest game. We've been doing it for like four years, but this year the game was off the charts. It was unbelievable. And I forget now, but it had like, I don't know, it got up to over a million views and uh, over 500 shares, you know. And when you look at that, Jared, and you see those kids' reactions of just playing the simple game. For them, it's just a, it's just a, a, a fun thing, you know. And when you see that, it puts everything in perspective. Yeah, you know what? Basketball is just something that we use to channel to go in so many different avenues, you know? And um, again, it's been a rewarding thing for me. I, I, I just love it. It's my passion. And uh, like I said, we kind of use basketball to teach guys about, you know, the, the ups and downs about life, how you can experience life, which you're going to have some ups, you can have some downs, how you're going to deal with them, you know? And um, you know, one of our favorite sayings, and it's so true in this day and age now, right? You know, it's not really what happens to you, but it's how you react to it, you know? And it is one of my favorite sayings. And, you know, in this period of time, you could see how that, that comes true. And, you know, we just talk to our players about that, you know, and there's just so much stuff out there now, you know, that the social media, it's, it's just, it's just um, amazing what, what kids experience now that they didn't when I was a kid growing up, you know? So again, we try, I just try to keep everything in perspective and say that, you know, yeah, look, it really is the game and uh, let's be, let's do the best we can, but it's, you know, it's more important to, for, for, to, 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 to build them their future. You know, what, what to be model citizens. That's kind of what we, how we approach it. You know, you, you mentioned some of the, the social media aspect and just some of the ways that, that things are different with how connected and constant some, some aspects can be. Would you say over time that that is, has been about the biggest change you've seen that you have to kind of manage and, and what is it like for a coach that, is a head coach from the eighties to now still we're in the 2020s and to manage some of those types of developments and figure out how to, to best handle their players and yeah. their players with, with those things and how those things affect their players and, and all those aspects. Yeah. Jared, it's not, it's not easy, man. It's a challenge because these kids are, you know, that I guess they're kind of impulsive, you know, the, the, the area we live in, you know, everything's just like that quick, you know, you go to McDonald's and if you have to stay in line for the, for God forbid a minute and a half, you know, you, people go crazy, you know, and you know, thank God for, for them and Chick-fil-A. I don't know. Don't ask me how they do it, but they're incredible. Uh, they, they, I want to learn how to manage people. They know how to get things going, but, uh, but, 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 you know, yeah, a couple of years ago, I had an incident on, on, uh, on, uh, God, I can't remember if it was Instagram or Twitter. I can't remember back then, but it was, it was something on social media where a kid put something out, you know, and it, it really was uh, kind of bad, you know. So 
uh, from from then on, it made me realize, man, you know, we really, and I, Jared, I had not, I, to be honest with you, as you say, you have to change. I can't, if I coached the way I coached in, 80, uh, 82, 83, I, I wouldn't have a job. If I did some of the things in the dressing room, you know, I say, I, I say one of my biggest fears is a, is a, a kid putting, his, putting the, t- the phone on in the dressing room. <laughs> I'm a lot better than I used to be. I've, I've gotten a lot better. I've learned that, God, again, I look back and say, man, well, I did some crazy stuff back then. But anyway, we can't, we can't even air it on here. But, but I couldn't do it today and I get fired. So um, I, I've tried to be, you know, again, better on that. But, but yeah, so, so the, when this first came out, you know, I started thinking to myself, well, you know, I mean, God, I really never told these kids, you know, how to approach that, and, you know, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, you know? So, and my assistant coaches are good because they're younger than I am and they're more into that kind of, you know, thing. And they teach me all the time about this stuff. I'm telling you, like, you know, they're like, coach, you know, watch this, you know? And so I've learned a lot from them and I've kind of let them, you know, kind of be our, uh, you know, I don't want to say watch dogs, but kind of, you know, watch things that are going on, you know? Uh, and then they will report to me, hey, coach, you know? So anyway, so yeah, we are, Jared, our first team meeting, we do a couple of things. We set our team goals for the year. What are we going to accomplish? What, what are we out here for? You know, we set our team goals and then we, then we talk about, okay, let's talk about drugs, alcohol, and social media, you know, and we, we approach and we tell them, Hey, this is not allowed. You cannot do it. You know? And I just tell them, I said, you better think before you hit that, that send button or the whatever go, you better think about what you're doing. And if it offends anybody or embarrasses anybody, you, you better not send it, you know? Um, and so, uh, we've been fortunate. We haven't had any incidences, you know, anything like that, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and it could happen any day and time, you know, Jared, I, I mean, man, I'm not on wood. I've been so blessed. You know, Jared, one of our things that we, um, the, again, you talked about, you know, trying to build a program. And one of the things we do is we travel a lot, you know, for, for, for games and for tournaments, we travel. And Jared, I think back on this 37, 37 years, you know, multiply 37 times uh, four tournaments. 28, 148, somewhere around 150, I think. Okay, so so 150 times I've taken my teams into hotels, staying oh, at minimum two nights, sometimes three nights in a hotel, traveling, you know. And so if you think about that, four kids in a room in a hotel, there's a lot of things that could happen. There's a lot of things that could go wrong that could happen. And I, I mean, I'm not going to time I've been blessed, but, you know, again, we try to think, you know, we try, we think that it's because we, you know, how we, uh, uh, how we relate to them and how we, you know, stress upon them, what, what's right and what's wrong, you know? And look, this, uh, this, I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. The worst thing ever was my assistant coach. I, he, I'll, I'll point him out. He'll let you know. The worst thing is Wesley Cortez and a couple other guys. I went around 1030 and I, I went around him and I, I could have sworn I heard some, you know, girls voices. And so I went in there and I put my ear and I said, Oh yeah. So I knock on the door and it gets quiet. And this is kind of funny. I knock on the door about three times and they come to the door and went over the door with all the lights are out and we had bedroom check at 11, but it was about 10 30. So all the lights are out. So I open the door and I walk in and they got that. They have the, the, the blankets. It's to their necks. I'm like, man, guys, you're getting a really nice rest tonight. Huh? <laughs> like, yeah. Coach, we're tired. <laughs> so I go pull the sheets back and they're still in their clothes, you know? So I said, guys, I could have sworn I heard girls voices in here and they didn't say anything. So I go walk and open the bathroom door and sure enough, there's a couple of girls that were, you know, and, and look, they were, there was nothing, they were doing nothing wrong, but it just wasn't the right, you know, we can't have, they got to do it, come to me and I, let's go in the lobby, you know, and visit with them. But anyway, again, no, no, but that, that's the worst thing that ever, in, in, you know, in, in, it's happened in one of our, in, in our, in our rooms at all those years, you know, and all those tournaments that we went to, you know, it, it, it's, it's remarkable that we, we've been very blessed. Like I said, I've had only one incident about social media, you know, and I mean, it could happen tomorrow, you know, so, but we really, you know, you gotta, you have to teach them, gotta coach them up and let them know that we're watching too. You know, I think it's important to know that, Hey, look, that somebody's always watching. You might think that we, we're going to find out, you know, because I think they think sometimes that, oh, the coaches, he's too old. He'll never see that. Or my assistants won't see it, but you know, we tell them, Oh, you, you, you you're going to, you know, you, you're going to get caught sooner or later. So, Again, we've been blessed and lucky uh, over the years that we really haven't had any any bad, bad incidences. Uh, it, it's been interesting to see how a lot of that stuff develops because social uh, social media and particularly as it, I mean, not particularly, but social media in general and also social media as it ties to some of the recruiting a- angles with athletes and stuff like that, it can be such an incredible tool or such a huge detriment depending on on how you use it and to to see high school age athletes learn that over time both 
in society and seeing how differently the kids now understand it than maybe 10 years ago when it was kind of just first starting as well as some of these guys and, and girls as they grow up and kind of get a little bit older and, and start to realize some of it, it, it can, it can go so well or, or yeah. so badly. And so I, I think that's something too with a lot of coaches that it's been interesting to see how, how you kind of grasp it and, and approach it because when it was starting out, coaches didn't know what to tell the kids about it. And, and now it's become such a huge part of their lives. No, no doubt. And like you said, I, after that first time, I, you know, I had no idea this was going on, you know, so uh, kind of interesting too. We tell our players, you know, I saw this happen. I know you have too, Jarrett, where, you know, a college coach, and, and again, you know, if you're a college player, they're not all college players, but there are some. And I tell them, if, a, you know, college coaches have, have backed off of some pretty darn good athletes that could have helped their program, but they saw what they were doing on social media. It's like, you know what? It's not the kind of kid we want in our program, you know? So, you know, we try to share that with them, that that's just happened before and that, these coaches are watching you and, you know, and, and again, if, if you handle yourself the right way and, you, and you're very fresh at what you do, then it, it could, it actually could be a plus for you that, man, look how this kid handles himself, you know, and maybe he's recruiting two kids who are exactly the same. And this kid's a little sketchy on social media and this kid's like professionals could be, and, you know, doing everything the right way. You know what, let's take this kid over that one. So it, I think it could well happen. I think that's, I think it's happening now, you know, so, uh, you know, and, and it's kind of funny in tying into that, but when I have my parents meeting, I tell my parents the same thing. I said, I got college coaches sitting in that stand. And sometimes they say, Hey, wait, that's that kid's parents. Uh Oh, we might not want to recruit that kid because the parents might be, you know, out of control, you know, so to speak. So, and again, I'm not saying my parents, I've been, I've been, I've been really blessed yet with some great, uh, great parents. I, so I'm certainly not saying that as, as mine, but you know, I've seen that happen in places where um, we, we got somebody in our own district that, the, the, the player wanted not playing halfway through the year. And it, it was it, the coach says the best thing happened to him because the dad was out of control, you know, like while the game's going on, you know? So yeah, again, uh, I've been in a great situation and I, sometimes I don't, you know, have to deal with this in my, in my situation, but other coaches out there have to. You mentioned too uh, about watching the last dance and, and seeing some of Michael Jordan's competitive edge and yeah. uh, us having just finished that a few days ago, I kind of wanted to ask you as a guy that, that was, I mean, has been around basketball your whole life and, and had a chance to, to watch uh, Jordan's career and, and that Bulls run through the 90s. Uh, what was that like watching some of that? Because uh, when, when Lopes and I were talking about it, it was we kind of came into basketball at that point and we're watching kind of the tail end of the first three P and then the Rockets two years and then the latter parts. And that's kind of what we grew up on. What was it like for you? watching back to, to some of those, I mean, great stories and performances and whatnot from the late eighties and, and throughout the nineties. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. It's funny you say that because so, you know, when I'm watching Jordan, you know, I, you know, this thinking, the, the, I'm just in front of me as the greatest player of all. And again, I'm, I'm a Jordan guy. I'm going to say, I, in my opinion, he's the greatest of all time. So, you know, and watching that at that time, you know, you did, I did that didn't enter my mind that I'm watching the greatest player to play basketball ever I'm just you know enjoying the Bulls run and enjoying him to see what he could do you know uh interesting enough uh I, I'm pretty sure um uh, uh Jordan uh didn't he hit uh didn't didn't he one of the final four he played in was in the Superdome Is yes that yeah in North Carolina, yeah. Right? Oh, he, hit that the, uh, he hit the shot against Georgetown yes. as I want as a freshman I think in, in New Orleans yeah that's right because yeah that that's when the Georgetown kid at the end right they had the last shot and he threw it right to the north, right to uh, the North Carolina player who was at the big the center of um, whatever um, I forgot the guy's name but yeah so I was at that game you know so here I am I'm watching Michael Jordan since his college days you know and um, you know just to see that run I do want to say a few things about this show all right so as a coach's perspective I, I you know I guess sometimes I look at things differently you know but a couple of things that caught my eye was when when he was running the sprints he was the first guy. Leading, leading the pack, you know? So he made that comment. I didn't ask him to do anything I wouldn't do, you know? And as, and as tough as he was on his teammates, and probably, Jared, he probably, he went over the line a few times, man, you know, with his teammates, you know? But at the very end, you know, they, they, they respected him because they knew that he was pushing them to try to be the best that they could be, you know? Uh, but so, so him running in, uh, when Bill, with Bill Cartwright, this kind of this touched my heart, to think that a guy in the NBA would, 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 Take would have the when 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 um, P 
Pippen said he ain't going in the game. When he took him, and I could tell he was talking to him. He's like, what are you doing? You know, I mean, again, I don't know what he was saying, but I'm sure that's what he was saying. And then they said that he broke down and cried in the dressing room and said, Pippen, you, you quit on us, man. You can't do that. You know, that really touched my heart that an NBA guy would, would, would do that. I, I got, I just gained some more respect for, for Cartwright. I mean, he, you know, he's, he wasn't a, obviously the one great, great players, but he was a pretty darn good role player in that team, you know. But uh, that caught my attention. Uh, the other thing was when Carl Malone, uh, I don't know if you know this, Jared, in 1977, before you were born, uh, I played in the top 28 in Lake Charles. It was hosted at Lake Charles, but it wasn't, it wasn't Burton. It was at the Civic Center. And uh, guess who we played in the state championship game? Summerfield. Summerfield. Carl Malone, eighth grader. So, so me and Carl Malone go back a long way. He don't know who the hell I am, but we go back a long way. <laughs> but anyway, so when he went in the team bus, did you see that at the end? Yeah. He went straight those – I mean, think about that. Here's an NBA guy, right? And they just got beat game six at home. And I guess, you know, through all the thrills, they can shake. You know, and I, th I think those NBA guys, they don't really shake hands after games. I think they kind of just do it informally, you know. But it's not one of those things where, I, like high schools, we go shake everybody's hand. They didn't do that, you know. And for him to go in that bus and tell those guys, congratulations. I, I mean, that, that, I get a lot more respect for Carl Malone as, as well with that, you know, because that's pretty, that's pretty cool, you know. Uh, so those are kind of some things that just – just caught my eye. Then I'm looking back at Pippen and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know, I'm having second thoughts about him. He had a migraine in game seven. He had a bad back in game six another year. He, uh, he, uh, he didn't go back into the game, in the game one time. Uh, his ankle, there's some question about why are you having surgery now with the ankle, you know? Well, I want to have this summer to do it, you know? So I don't know, man. I, 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 and I always did like Pippen. So now I'm having second thoughts about what kind of guy really is Pippen? I, I don't know, you know. I think Jordan had some kind of comment about, you know, kind of rolled his eyes about the migraine. So I don't know. I'm not sure how all that fit in. But uh, I am having a different look at Pippen, and I'm not sure, um, you know, how, what, what it, what, how much his heart is. Yeah, his yeah I don't know. I, again, I don't question his ability on the court, but maybe some of that outside stuff. Maybe, you know, he really wasn't that team. You know, again, they said when Jordan left, he was the team leader, and I'm not sure he was – ever ready to be that kind of guy. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that's his, that's, I don't think that's his personality to be that, that team leader. Yeah. That was something actually, I don't remember if it was the second to last week or it might've not been until this past week, yeah. but I tweeted, I was interested in, and didn't get much feedback, but I was interested to hear from younger people who hadn't watched any of that live. Yeah what their perspective on Pippen was from just watching the docuseries. Cause I remember growing up and, and thinking of him as, as certainly one of the top players in the league at that, that point, And really ever he was when they, they had the, the anniversary top 50 players in NBA history, he was one of the top 50 and he really, they, they, they had those moments all being pushed together in the span of 10 episodes of, of television yeah. really kind of highlighted a lot of those aspects that, that you just mentioned. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And then the last thing is, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, you know, as as all this went, all this went down, you know, you're thinking, man, how, how could they let it, you know, how could they let it happen? Not to go like, and like Jordan said, you got to believe. I think what Pippen was the one, the contract here, like so to speak, where he might, they might not have got him. But then you got to think that if all those other, if, if Jordan says, okay, they're giving up everybody one more year, you know, if Jordan would have gone and, and they all would have went back to win, you know, to win seven. I just, I, I just, I just have a hard time believing how the owner could not step in. When I, and he did kind of step in because I remember he said he offered Jackson. He said, "Hey, look, I know what's going on, but and and at that point, Jackson, you know, there's no point of no return when you're going to go in the beginning of the year and the guy says, "I don't care if you win 70 games, you're not coming back." And, you know, then I wouldn't have gone back either. You know, so I get that, but God, I just don't know how I could have let that unfold in front of him. You know, uh, to let that happen. To you know, so uh, that was that was kind of interesting as well. And uh, the last thing too, Jared is. I look back on Phil Jackson and man, like ju just different philosophies, you know, and look, uh, he's, I think I, he does look down. He's obviously one of the greatest coaches of, in NBA history. I mean, he, his record speaks for itself, you know, and again, I know he had some, he had great players now, you know, so I get all that too. He was lucky where he coached that, but at the same time, it's tough, but for him to do like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, if, if one of my players comes and says, Hey coach, um, Look, I need a little time off. I'm going to go ski with my parents in Colorado. I'll be back next week, you know. <laughs> okay, sure. When he comes back next week, he's on the end of the bench, and I don't think he ever sees the court again, right? I mean, you know, how can he – but, man, to think 
And Jared, what do you think? Do you think in this social media time that things have changed? Do you think that do you think that could have happened? Could you think that? I mean, I think that that got again, and you know, you saw the reporters, and it was a big deal. But you think Rodman could have gone, and they would it, it would have happened that he could have gone for to Vegas on a trip, and you know, whatever he did, party for, and missed. You know, I just don't, I just don't get that. I'm not sure that would have happened today. I mean, for Phil to let him do that, and still, I guess he still had the respect of the players. You know, to me, that'd be a revolt in this day and age if somebody if I yeah. would leave like that. You know, and then so we pay him. He's not coming to practice, and then. You know, he's, so to speak, he's thinking, I, I don't have a spot. I'm the sixth guy, and you're going to play him? You know, I don't know. I just don't know how he pulled all that off. And when I look back at Phil Jackson, it was really remarkable how he handled all that stuff. I, I, it, I couldn't have done it the same way. There's just no way. It's not my yeah. personality, you know? Yeah, I, I took away – I've always had a lot of respect for Phil Jackson and certainly watching the way he was able to manage – so much going on yes. with, I mean, the stuff you just mentioned, but yeah. there were just so so many different angles going on, and to, to keep those those teams ready to go compete and and win championships year in and year out is is kind of incredible. And I knew going into the series that I would be as as somebody that didn't. I mean, I was still a kid at that point, so I didn't get into media until years later. That yeah. I would look at the uh, the relationships and openness for the media at that point and, mm-hmm. and kind of um, be jealous of the way things were in, in that field at that point. Um, but because of the way a lot has developed with the 24 seven news cycle and social media and everything there, I mean, it could, it could never be the same level of access today as it was then because there's, there's no way it would have worked yeah. out. I mean, yeah. there's no way so many aspects of that show in terms of off the court stuff and Rodman is, is the primest of all examples yeah. could have worked out today. Jerry, can you imagine being whatever, I don't know what club he was at in Vegas. Can you imagine the phones that would have been recording him right there? Him yeah. and uh, what's your name? Carmen Electra. I mean, that'd have been, that'd have been a million views of him and that, you know, I mean, it's just, crazy. it's just, again, it's a different world we live in. And that's why I just don't think that that could happen today. What, what happened back then, you know, uh, just, just crazy, man. But uh, now look, you got to give it, you, you know, as crazy as Robin was, I mean, it's true. When he got on the court, dude, that dude was, he got yeah. after it, you know? Yeah, he got after it. But uh, it had been hard for me to manage him. And like you said, you know, was just so laid back, you know, I think that's the thing I struck about him was he, he was so laid back. You know, one thing, again, I never realized it and that he coached, uh, overseas. I, I never, I never knew that about Phil Jackson, you know? Oh yeah. I wanted to ask you this. Did you see the game, uh, with, uh, when they showed pistol Pete scored 68 the other night? Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So on that court is Phil Jackson. He was a goofy looking player, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he was good. But you know, you got Phil Jackson, you got a uh, Walt Frazier, uh, you got Senator Bill Bradley, uh, you know, uh, on that court. And then, uh, I'm thinking to myself, Oh, oh who was the – I forget. They kept showing the coach. Who was the coach that played for the Lakers? I can't remember who that was. Oh, um, was uh, Elgin Baylor was – Elgin Baylor. Yeah. Elgin Baylor's coaching. I mean, you got, you know, you got legends from all kinds on that court with pistol scored 68. I'm like, God, it's, I, I just – you know, didn't, you didn't put all that together at the time. I'm like, wow. But, uh, yeah, to see Phil Jackson in that uniform, I'm like, oh, dude, man, this guy, he is something else. But that was yeah. pretty – I actually – this is – so random, but I have Elgin Baylor's no signature way. on a a Mountain Dew advertisement from it was a, it was a uh, an opening weekend of an N- an NCAA tournament in New Orleans when no uh, when Jason Williams was one of the guards for Florida and uh, I think Chris Marcus was playing in Western Kentucky and yeah. there was a a group we got to go see two games and I was. I might have been early high school, as middle school, early high school, and yeah, yeah. my friend's dad that had taken us pointed that that was Elgin Baylor, Elgin and I, <laughs> I knew I knew the name as again one of the NBA greats way yeah. before my time, and went and asked for an autograph on whatever I could find, and I, I had no idea he had been a coach in I mean in New Orleans and in that yeah. building, really. I totally I totally forgot until they showed the highlights. Hey, by the way, uh, story about P- Pistol Pete, my only encounter ever with him, oh, other than watching him play in, in you know in New Orleans. Um, you know, he was a born again Christian, you know, he had gotten into drugs and alcohol and, you know, got away from his faith where he was a born again Christian and Lafayette high school had this, uh, pro, uh, uh, 
program, I say program, uh, called Young Life, okay? And so I don't know how they did it, pulled it off, but they got, again, he retired. They got him, he was living in Covington. They got him to come on a Saturday morning to talk to their Young Life group about, about you know, life in general, you know? So the coach when I had high called me and said, hey, Danny, Pistol Pete Maverick is coming in. Uh, look, why don't you invite some of your players to come and you're welcome to come and, and, and see. I said, man, don't, you know, again, that's my idol, Jared, growing up. You know, I mean, I'm, I got the floppy socks. I'm trying to grow the long hair. <laughs> that's my man. You know, at some point in time, he wore 44. I don't know. Was that at LSU or was that? I don't know. Uh, I he wore 44 no. at one time. I had 44 in my jersey, whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, so, so, so listen. So, man, I'm getting there. I, and I'm not, really some, I'm not really an early, early person but to get places. But this time, I ain't missing this. So, I think it started about 9 o'clock. So, about, about 7.45, I get in the, in the parking lot, laugh at high, and I drive in. There's nobody there. I look at my rearview mirror, and the coach is opening the gym. But it's still early. I've got the radio on. I'm just listening to music. I'm going to wait till somebody gets there. And on the right side of me, drives up, uh, kind of funny, but like the OJ, the, the white Bronco. And that's what pistol was, was, and I just saw white Bronco and look and I looked back and I said, Jared, I got, I'm serious. My heart started popping. I mean, this is my idol, right? And I'm like, holy moly, this pistol. <laughs> so he gets out of his car and then he go, opens the back and he gets a bat. So I said, well, shit, I'm following him in. What the hell? So I get out of my car and I, I just kind of follow him in. He never sees me. He goes up and when he gets there, he puts his bag and he's open up and he, he's lacing his tennis shoes. So I just walk in. I said, oh. I said, I, and I, you know, again, I know, Ms. I said, I said, hey, hey, Pistol Pete, how you doing? He said, hey, I'm doing good. And Jared, I was really, I was, again, I was young now, you know, I looked like I was seven. He probably thought I was a high school player. I, I don't think he had any idea I was a coach because I'm, I'm serious. I look 15. So I sit there and he goes, uh, hey, uh, would you mind catching up for me? He gets his ball out. I said, oh, sure. Jared, when I'm telling you, I'm not lying. I didn't count. I didn't count. But he probably took at least 50 shots. He, he missed, he, made, he probably made 48 out of 50. I, twice I remember going to get the ball that wrong. I just sat in the basket and I kept feeding him. And he kept going around in a circle. And he, I mean, look, he just wouldn't miss. It was incredible. And so I have this yellow, I'm like you. They, they had a young life thing and I went, take it out of my car. I said, oh no, I can't. I went out of my car and I heard and we get a pin and I got it to sign it because I said, I, I can't miss an opportunity, you know. And uh, he was, I mean, he was, look, he was, he was really cool about the whole thing, you know. And uh, it wasn't long after that that I hear my, I never forget hearing the news, I heard on the radio, uh, y'all, Pistol Pete Maverick has died of a, a parent heart attack. And I'm like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. And he was playing some pickup game somewhere. I can't remember where, but it was a pickup game with older guys and he collapsed on the court and died. But um, yeah, man, I, I know, I'll never forget that day as long as I live. But you talk about I can shoot the basketball. He just had a touch that was, it was remarkable. That's, that's another great story. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I knew we'd end up, having a, a really long call we're gonna have to do this again i gotta go run and talk to one of these uh these young high school stars that's going to be representing uh he plays at catholic point Capi and, and he'll be playing at the college level after this senior year but uh man great catching up and I, catch I know up. we hey i gotta share one more story with you uh jerry sloan passed away today yeah go to utah jazz now so listen to this i think it's 86 don't quote me that but it's early the cajun dome has just opened up had a guy named Jim McGee, who was a big promoter, and he got around. He knew well, he knew Frank Layton. So he called up Layton and he said, Hey, would you consider doing an exhibition game in Lafayette, Louisiana against the Rockets? And Layton said, Yeah. So so Jim McGee arranged this whole thing. He got the Jazz to come in, paid them so much, paid the Rockets, come in. So he came to me as a high school coach and said, Coach, I'm getting this game. Could you help with your players sell tickets? And I'm like, yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I, I want to see this game. So he gave me like, I don't know, 10 tickets. And our guys were fired up about it. So like we sold like 200 tickets to the game, you know. So I guess he felt, you know, like, man, this guy helped me out. So he calls me and says, Coach, uh, listen, I want to invite you. I'm going, I'm having a dinner with Layden and Sloan. Would, would you want to come? <laughs> I'm like, thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Hell yeah. So we go to, it's an old place, an old, old establishment in Lafayette called Elise's Pizza House. It's still rocking today. It's one of the best pizzas, seriously, around. It's unbelievable. So we go to Lisa's Pizza House, and I'm, I'm going to share your story with you. Well, two things. I was, in, I was, I was blown away by Leighton. I, I can't remember all the things he did, but, y'all, he started off with, like, just, a, I guess, a beer, you know, like, a big, you know, give me a beer. And then the next drink was, uh, uh, was uh, 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 vodka and tonic or something, and then he wanted a, a – 
uh, an old fashioned, and then he wound up with a uh, uh, margarita. Like I'm, I'm, I'm blows my mind away. They had like four different drinks. Like I'm like, who does that? I thought you know everybody just orders the same four completely different drinks. He, I guess he just like like to drink different stuff or try it out. I don't know, but this is a true story. He tells us about took the, the took the team exhibition to Italy, and they uh, they had some beach, and he said they're sitting him and his wife are in a chair, and after about 15 minutes, he notices that mm, didn't have any idea, but he happened to be at a nude beach. So he's, he said about, about 20 minutes later, his wife says, babe, I'm going in, it's hot. He goes, I think I'll stay out a little while. <laughs> he, he says, three hours later, he got back to the room. He got back to the room and he said, he couldn't, he was so sunburned, he couldn't put a shirt on. <laughs> so that's a true story about Frank Layton, the coach of the Utah Jazz, getting burnt on the beach in, in, in Italy. Is there a beach in Italy? I don't even know if there's a beach in Italy, but they went somewhere around there. I don't know. <laughs> it's a true story though. That's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't put, he said, I soap sunburned. I couldn't put a shirt on. He said, oh, man. Man, that's great. If you have to edit that out of our Zoom, go ahead and edit it. No, out. no, I, I love it. I think, I think that's a great story that, you know, that, that folks that, that have been around basketball and, and know Frank Layden that yeah. in particular, that's, that's going to be a really funny story. Yeah, funny. Hey, by the way, so Jerry Sloan was, you know, sitting there, man, talk about a, that. That's a first. Layton was funny as hell. Jokes all night long. I could tell you story after story. But, uh, but, but, man, talk about Sloan was a laid back, just a, a class, class guy, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, I think those two guys did a pretty darn good job at the Utah Jazz, you know, when you think about it, uh, bringing them where they were. I know they had, they had Malone and Stockton, but, uh, Oh, and, and okay, so I got to take, I got to take this with you too. So I, I, I've been lucky. I just have run-ins with guys, but another true story. When he, when they bought him in, when they bought, they bought the Utah Jazz in. Okay. So guess what? McGee, he says, I'm going to bring you two guys to talk to your players. I said, this is fantastic. You know, and I'm thinking, uh, I think at the time there's Elijah one. I'm thinking Elijah one and somebody else, you know, little did I know. So he brings in two guys that come in. And I don't, I don't recognize him. Well, one of them was Mel Turpin. You remember Mel Turpin? I think played yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. The thing I was most impressed about Mel Turpin, I think he wore a 16 or 18 size shoe, and it looked like ski boots when he came in. Went up. But guess who the other guy was? John Stockton. Jared, you have to put the things together. This is '86. When he said Gonzaga, Gonzaga wasn't on the basketball map. They weren't in. I thought it was in New York. I'm like Gonzaga. Okay. I never forget it. And I got this video somewhere. I got to find it. It's in my, one of my collections. We, I videoed it because I said, I got two NBA guys coming in. It's in that old, you know, with old VCR video. And I never forget his words. He told my guys, he goes, I'm John Stockton. He said, he said, the Utah Jazz took a chance on me. He said, nobody knows who I am. I come from a small school from Gonzaga. He said, but you know what? He said, I'm going to prove the Utah Jazz were right when they drafted me. He said, I'm going to make this roster. Can you imagine that? The all-time leading assist and steals leader was in our gym talking to our guys, and he said, I'm going to make this NBA roster. Crazy. Yeah. 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 I'm going to pull that out to show you that video. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, it would be cool to see it. Yeah, I would definitely love to see that video. Yeah, yeah it'd be cool. So. He, hey, by the way, Stockton looked 15 when he came to our gym. <laughs> also, look at that, that cat. I mean, seriously, he was unassuming. If he had just walked in the gym and you said, that guy's going to be is, – is, is playing for a college team, I mean, a pro team, you'd be like, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, he, he really was unassuming, man, really. But yeah, the rest is history, you know. All right, I know we got to go. No, Always it's enjoy, been, my, always enjoy yeah. my time with you. Appreciate you, Danny, likewise. You bet. Take care, Jared. Bye. Danny Brucer. Thanks, man. Bye-bye.